Our subject today is dinosaurs and dragons. Hopefully, the video, I tried to do it just because I thought it was funny and a great way to start, but it also puts, I think, this lesson in perspective. As far as the range of theology and things that we talk about, dinosaurs and dragons are down near the bottom, okay? So we're going to talk about it according to the lesson plan and uh, hope you enjoy it, learn something. But there may be things you disagree with, and that's okay, because I'm not sure I agree with everything either that they're presenting here. But we're going to talk about uh, dinosaurs and dragons. First, here's our memory verse, Psalm 8, 5, and 6. Yet you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings, that is, man, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. I want to review just a little bit uh, last week. How did we define the biblical view of marriage? How did we define the biblical view of marriage last week? Any ideas? Oh, I know you know this. Okay, Jim. One man, one woman. You all knew this, didn't you? So you can just say it. You know, it's no problem. Don't be afraid. And what was that definition based on? <clears throat> okay, Jim. <laughs> yeah, it was based on God's word, right? God said it. There's one man, there's one woman. That was our definition of marriage. Uh, I remember John was saying last week, too, that... Uh, they took a rib from Adam. And I, for, I forget what you said about that, John. To be alongside. To be alongside. I remember when I was growing up, uh, somebody said they took, uh, the rib came from his side. It didn't come from his head so that she would dominate him. And it didn't come from his feet so that he would trample her under feet. So it's like, I kind of like that too. But anyways, that's what happened. So... Uh, yeah, that's what we talked about last week. We defined marriage. And so this week, oh, what, biblical marriage is one man married to one woman for life. This comes from the pattern set by God's creation of Eve and then Adam's side in Genesis 2 and the words of Christ regarding the allowance for divorce because of the hardness of people's hearts in Mark chapter 10. So good review. Did man and dinosaurs live together? Yes? Yes? Okay, I see a lot of head shaking. Yes, you're right, they did. Um, I got a little video to show you first, and I, I like this. There was, we've got two more videos to see. This is the longer one, but excellent video about dinosaurs. So let's uh, play that. Yeah, sorry, folks. Uh, but that's about 10 minutes or 14 minutes of our lesson. So we might be done early. We'll see. Okay, on. Uh, let's talk about this. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I got, there's a headline from the paper. I, I, I look for this when I'm doing lessons just to see what there is. Fish lizard fossils found in the Swiss Alps belong to some of the largest creatures ever lived. So here's the question they ask. So how did the remains of massive sea creatures, including one longer than a bowling alley, end up, end up at an altitude of 9,186 feet? How did that happen? Anybody know? The flood. The flood. No, I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> no, not that. 200 million years ago, the rock layers were on the floor of a wide lagoon. Why do you hear this? But we think that the big ichthyosauruses followed schools of fish into the lagoon. Then the unfolding of the Alps, which began 95 million years ago when the African tectonic plate began to push up against the European tectonic plate, created piles of rock layers about 30 to 40 million years ago. The fossils were tectonically deformed, squashed by the tectonic plate movements, and pushed them in a rock formation to the top of the mountain. Now, doesn't that make sense? How ridiculous. Go ahead. I'm going to see, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say play their devil's advocate. <laughs> Yes, 
there was a worldwide covering flood. But here's the thing. If that mountain was as high as it is now, back then, mm -hmm. where did all the water go? It was 9,000 feet of water around the whole world? No, that's not what happened. This, this did come up like crazy in the Alps, too. And a lot of other mountains were folding and, and, and overthrusting and underthrusting. And so, you know, yes, we can laugh at what they're saying about the, you know, the millions of years and all this kind of stuff, but it was a lot lower at that time. That could be, yeah. But it's just interesting because, um, you know, we know the flood and we know what happened in the flood. And when the waters decreased and all these dead animals were there, it's no wonder they would find carcasses on the top of the Alps. I remember we went to, uh, I don't forget where it was, Tucson, I think it was, or, or uh, uh, when our Joni's folks lived out there in Arizona. And we, yeah, it was Tucson, the Desert Museum. And we went there and our kids were with us and they, we got there and they, they said they found bones of sea creatures in, in Tucson, in the desert. I said, how can that be? Well, guess what? They had an explanation of how this happened. And I said to the kids, well, how do you think the fish bones and all that got in the desert? And they both said, well, that was the flood, Dad. Yeah, that was the flood. We have such a simple explanation, don't we? You know, there, there's some things we don't understand, but other things God gives us just what we need to know. And so, anyhow, excellent. Okay, let's move on here. Here's Job. We're going to take a look at Job a minute. Um, and this is some of the things that Job said. However, the question is, when did Job live? Do we know? It's, it's said that it's one of the oldest books in the Bible. It doesn't mean that he was one of the oldest. It just means when it was written, it was probably one of the first books written. But we don't know when necessarily Job lived. So we need to determine that to determine what he's going to say about these creatures. Uh, I looked up a couple of different people. Um, John MacArthur, he said Job's age, his lifespan was about 200 years. You know, Adam and Eve, they lived, what, 900 years, 800 years, and it slowly decreased. Well, 200 years, so put it about the time of Abraham. Uh, Matthew Henry agreed with that. Um, he had a couple other things here that I thought was interesting. Um, yeah, the patriarchal period, John MacArthur says, uh, Abraham was 175 years, so Job was probably around there. Uh, Matthew Henry agrees with that. Uh, Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, another good uh, commentary, uh, basically says the same thing. It fixes it two ages before Moses or about the, the time of Abraham, okay? So now we know if he lived at the time of Abraham, what period of time was that? We get the timeline from creation on. Uh, if he lived about the time of Abraham, was that before the flood or after the flood? After the flood, okay. So now we got Job, he's living after the flood, and we're gonna see some of the things that God says to him, and, well, let's see. They have me reading something to you, and uh, here it is. When I consider how creative God is, I think about hummingbirds and their shimmering iridescent feathers. I think of majestic birds like the peacock or the vibrant color of the Amazon parrots or the brilliant patterns on tiny poison dart frogs or the amazing tongue of the chameleon. He has made creatures that fly using all kinds of wings, bats, birds, butterflies, and people. The multitudes of graceful, graceful antelope roam the plains of Africa alongside the gallant lion and the imposing elephants in the oceans we find miniature creatures that produce their own glass houses, fish with striking patterns of color and texture, creatures, lobsters with probing claws, the great whales that travel the globe in search of food, and many amazing creatures. Oh, and don't let us forget the amazing strength and beauty of the kofir, with its long horn and flowing manes. The kofir alone de demonstrates God power and creativity. Don't you agree? 
Yeah? <laughs> Guess what? There's no such thing as a cobra. And I was like, I wasn't even going to read this. Like, That's kind of silly, but I get the point. Um, what, what significance is there in the kofer? No significance. It's not real. And it'd be silly of me to use an explanation like that for something that's not real, wouldn't it? So when we look at Scripture, we look at Job, and some of the things that God is going to say to Job about certain creatures, they existed. They weren't make-believe like the Kofir. And if they were make-believe, it wouldn't make sense. So anyhow, on we go. Let's take a look at Job 39. Um, so God is going to describe to Job some things. Let's take a look at this. Job 39, 1, 5, and 9. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? <laughs> this is when Job, after, after Job has decided, you know, he, he knows more than God. And uh, he's giving God what for. Uh, God comes back and says, do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Stop there a second. You know, what, what, is, what is God really saying to Job? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Job goes, no, I have no idea. Do you observe the calving of the does? Job would say, no, I have no idea. What is God saying there? God is saying, I do. Wait a minute. In all the creation, God knows when a mountain goat gives birth? Really? Yeah, that's what he says. Do you observe the calving of the does? I've always wanted to find out where they sleep at night. I've never found out. We look for deer all the time. Never. But God knows when they, when they calf. Isn't that amazing? Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey? Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? The wings of the ostrich wave proudly. But are the, they the pinions and plumage of love? Do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the, oak, like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the earth? Which animals do you see in here? It's okay. You're reading. You can just say it. Wild I'm sorry? Wild yeah, wild animals. Goats? Deer? Donkeys? Ostrich? Horse? Right? Okay. What's God using? Real animals? Yeah, okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's go on. Let's keep that in mind. Let's go Job 40. Okay. Behold behemoth which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. Whew. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Let him who made him bring near his sword, for the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Under the lo lotus plants he lies, in the shadow of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade the locust trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened, he is confident though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? Who's talking and who's he talking to? God. He's talking to Job and he's sharing some things here. What type of literature is this? 
ideas. Sounds a little bit like poetry, but it's really history, isn't it? This guy's kind of reviewing what happened. Yeah, I, I would say it was. And what creature is it talking about here? The behemoth. Whatever the behemoth is. Oh, Jim, you're going to tell us before I get to that part. Okay, thank you. Wait till I get there, and then you can, you can dispute me. <laughs> okay. I know, Jim. You know, and uh, let me stop here a second. That's why this lesson is a good lesson, but it's done near the negotiables as far as theology goes, okay? There's some people who agree with this, some people won't, but let me continue with the lesson anyways. Okay, what does the behemoth eat? Grass, like an ox, right? Okay, get that. How is the size of the behemoth described? Let's look back. Well, look at this. For his shade, the lotus trees cover him. The willows of the brook surround him. Okay, he he's, sounds like a big guy, doesn't he? How is the strength of the behemoth described? Well, let's see. Let's go back here. His bones are like tubes of bronze. His limbs like bars of iron. This guy is strong, isn't he? This is really something. How is his tail described? Did you catch that? Like a cedar tree. Wow, okay. We're going to talk about that in another minute. Where does the behemoth live? Well... Look at verse 21, it says, Under the lotus plants he lies in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. So kind of like in a swampy area, it sounds like, doesn't it? Who is able to subdue the behemoth with a sword? God, the only one. Nobody can do it. What does this passage tell us about God? Well, that's so important any time we read Scripture, is what does it tell us about God? What does this tell us about God? He's the creator. He created Job, and he created the behemoth, whatever that is. We're going to find out, maybe. What creature might God be describing to Job? What's the possibilities that a behemoth could be? Dinosaurs? Okay. Anything else? You all have your Bibles there? Uh, open it to, to Job 40, where it mentions behemoth. And if any of you have a study Bible, see what your notes say about it, okay? Um, let, me, let me give you this one thing here. Where is it? That's uh, coming up. Let me read it. Well, go ahead. I'll, I'm going to find out what you guys say, and then we'll, we'll take a look. Anybody have anything that your, your Bible says about the behemoth? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. It says it's a hippo. says it's a hippo. Okay. Did that sound like a hippo? Yeah. No? Pretty close. Pretty close. Except for the tail. Except for the tail. Boy, that, little tail. that little tail gets you every time, doesn't it? That's, by the way, we're going we're gonna to get to this, but let me just read it now. Uh, D.A. Carson suggests that in the, in the New Te Bible commentary that the behemoth is a hippo and ex explains the tail conflict by saying, even his tail, though short and small, has the strength of a cedar. The tail of a hippo is very small and is quite as stretched to the imagination to compare it to a cedar tree, isn't it? Now... Folks, I was, I was at a weekend with D.A. Carson. <laughs> I would not argue with D.A. Carson. They, they had a question and answer period, and they would ask D.A. Carson all these, questions, these deep theological questions. You know how he would answer every single one? The Bible says, and then he would give his answer. This guy was impressive, really impressive. He's a, the, a modern theologian. But he even says, well, you know, I think it's a hippo. 
Well, let's take a look. Go on here. There's an elephant, and there's a hippopotamus. What's the problem with either one of those being a behemoth? You see a problem? What is it? It's that tail again, isn't it? It's amazing. Now, let's look. I, I, wanted, I threw this one in. Uh, hopefully you can see it. That's the cedar tree. It's kind of blurry, but down in the bottom, is it any better here? Down in the bottom, there's a car and a bunch of people. That's how enormous the cedar tree is. Now, there's the cedar tree. There's the tails of an elephant and a hippopotamus. Do you see a comparison? I don't see a comparison. So what could it be? Does an elephant and a, a hippo have a tail like a cedar? Here's a couple other questions. Here's a, a seropod, a dinosaur with a long tail and neck like an apo, aptosaurus or a bronchiosaurus. I'm not an expert in dinosaurs, by the way. My grandkids love dinosaurs. They know everyone, you know, but I am not. Here's what he looks. There's the behemoth. That supposedly would have been. Does he fit the bill? Yeah, he kind of does fit the bill, doesn't he? Could it be a dinosaur? Well, interesting. If it is a dinosaur, that's about the time of Abraham. So what happened to the dinosaurs? Well, that's my last video that probably won't play, but we'll talk about it when we get there. Go ahead, Jim. Yes. Yeah, there's a, let's, let's go back here a minute. Uh, let's see if I, okay, look at verse 23. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he's not frightened. He is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Now, does it sound like a hippo or an elephant would be willing to go into floodwaters? It doesn't, doesn't seem to fit, okay? Again, folks, we're... A little bit on the idea of opinions here, but, okay? There's the behemoth. Psalm, or Job 41, 1 to 2. Now we have another critter. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope on his, in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Okay. What kind of creature is this? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Pastor. Yes. Excellent comment. <laughs> yeah. Good point. For, for those watching at home, <clears throat> what Pastor just said is it says that only God could subdue this creature. And we know that mankind has trained elephants and we, we control all those animals. So it, it sounds like it's something bigger than that, doesn't it? Okay, let's see where we are here. Um, so where, where was this, where would we find this critter? Any ideas? <coughs> well, can you draw at the Leviathan with a fish hook? Where would you find an animal that you want to catch with a fish hook? In the water, right? So here's a creature that's in the water. Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? No, I don't think so. 
So what's the Leviathan like? He's kind of fierce, isn't he? You're not going to catch this guy with a fish hook. Bigger than that. Let's jump to verses 8 to 12. Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. <laughs> okay. Have you seen those guys fishing to catch a, a shark or something? Fight? Lay, lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? His sneezings bring forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of a fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils come forth smoke, and from a boiling pot and burning rushes. <sighs> this is some guy. Oh, I got two more verses. His breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth out of his mouth. In his neck abides strength and terror dances before him. Wow. What is he like? Pretty fierce, isn't he? Uh, I'm not sure where that breathing fire comes from and how that would be shown in an animal, even a dinosaur or a dragon. We see pictures of dragons, don't we, where they show them fire breathing. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but... Anyways, that's the way God describes him. I find that very interesting. Y'all with me? Any questions? Any comments? We, we doing okay? You know, there's a... <clears throat> I'll ask a question. Growing up from the time you were little to the time you're now, how many have ever heard dinosaurs talked about in church? <laughs> Mark, good for you. Josiah, hmm. Blaze, hmm. Yeah, we don't hear about it. They don't talk about it. They never talked about dinosaurs when I was little. Because how did they explain them? Well, God has an explanation. And we should never look at the Bible to prove science. But it's kind of interesting what the Bible says and just fits in with a lot of what we see today. We can't deny fossils, can we? I mean, there's, there's, they find fossils of brontosauruses, and they're big, you know. Granted, they'll find a little bone and they'll take that little bone and create some creature out of it. But they find big bones and find creatures like that. And it's like, how do you explain that? How does the Bible explain it? Well, this is kind of how. Um, okay, let's, let's go on here. <clears throat> oh, how do we describe this today? Uh, some people say this could be a crocodile, or an alligator. How do you think that fits? Not well. It doesn't breathe fire, that's for sure. And you try to catch one, you wouldn't try again. They're catching them all the time. What's his face? The, the alligator wrestler, he wrestled with them. No, it doesn't sound, this creature sounds much bigger than that. There's a leviathan <laughs> breathing fire. Quite a creature, isn't it? Okay. Yes, Pastor. So when we're talking about dinosaurs, we have to keep in mind the Bible is not designed to be a science textbook, nor is it seeking to answer every modern question that scientists or scholars have about dinosaurs. Um, we, what we want to be making sure that we're keeping in mind, and I feel like the ancient Bible curriculum does help us to do this, is that for us to have a meaningful worldview, we have to have some way in which we can account for these things. Yes. And so if the Christian worldview sought to say there is no such thing as a dinosaur, at least when he never existed, well, then we have a clear problem because there is physical evidence that these things existed. Right. Um, often what we see, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that we see over time have, have um, sought to communicate a, a major problem between um, Christians So we are viewing it from a biblical worldview that does have an accounting for these things, though it does not seek to answer every question that we could ask about them. Right. So it's not seeking to explain how big these creatures are spotted or um, where these creatures, um, what all of their habitat looks like or whatever. Uh, the Bible is not trying to answer those questions. Uh, but as we look in the scriptures, 
this is going to be uh, a revelation of what is happening in reality, and we do see those things in reality. Mm -hmm. I can't sum that up in a minute <laughs> so for you folks at home. Pastor's basically saying we have a Christian biblical worldview and we have to look at dinosaurs and say, how did they fit into our worldview? Uh, if we have no answer, that's a problem. But the Bible gives us enough of an answer here to understand. We don't understand all about them. Uh, we don't understand all what happened with them. We're going to talk about that in a minute or two. And we may have differences on that. But the Bible gives us just enough that we can explain. Somebody says, well, what about dinosaurs? Oh, 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 they're not in the Bible. Yeah, they are. Turn to Job 39 and 40, and here's what you see. It is in the Bible. Go ahead, Pastor. Yeah. And, and especially when you look what we're believing about the flood. What animals yes. came under the flood? Two of every kind. Uh, two of every species or two yeah. of every single animal that existed, or two of every continent. So there would have been some sort of Thank you for stealing my thunder. It's okay. It's okay. No, we were going to get to that, but that's okay. Um, yeah, this is important. And, and what pastor's saying, let's just talk about it now. Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Yes. How yes, pastor says yes. Don't disagree with pastor. No. Question, how many have been to the ark encounter? Any? Okay. Did you see a space for a, bron a bronchosaurus? Bronchiosaurus in, the, in there? The ark was pretty big. <clears throat> pretty big. That's really big. How could, how could Noah take two of a kind of a dinosaur and fit them in the ark? Any ideas? Uh -uh. They were babies. He took two of a kind. It doesn't say he took full grown adults. He could have taken two little babies in the ark, right? And that way they would fit very easily, but the species would go on. So, yeah, there's an explanation for everything when we really think about it. But again, we're not defending the Bible. The Bible speaks for itself. We're just saying when somebody asks us, how can we answer them? Right. Yeah, you're right. We don't have to make unbelievers believe it. And we have to be careful not to go beyond what the Bible says. You know, we've, we've looked at some information here this morning about dinosaurs and the proof of dinosaurs in Scripture, but that's all it says. It doesn't tell us anymore. So beyond this point, uh, to be dogmatic one way or another is doing more than Scripture does. You'll see what I mean in a couple of minutes. There's a bunch of application questions. Let's, let's take a look at those. A lot of times we don't even have time to do these because the lessons are so long. But since I just saved 14 minutes by not having my video play, uh, let's try this. Uh, what is the importance? You know, <laughs> okay, Pastor, you answer. What is the importance in our world today of having an explanation for the existence of dinosaurs on a young Earth? Why is that important? Well, Pastor answered most of it, I think, and it's it fits into our biblical worldview. We shouldn't deny. I think that's why when I was growing up, and a lot of you, it sounds like growing up, they never talked about dinosaurs. They didn't know how to explain them. And 
if we look at Scripture, it's very easy to see that God is explaining them, isn't he? And so it's important that we understand that when somebody says, oh, what about the dinosaurs? Well, yeah, it's in Scripture. Uh, I don't know all about them. It doesn't say a whole lot, but here's what it does say about them, and you, we can easily show them that. Um, okay, good, next one. Knowing that the vast majority of books, movies, and television programs teach that dinosaurs lived and died 65 million years ago, how can you help children and others and understand this issue from a biblical perspective? Hmm, good question. Many answers. Most all of science and philosophy all teaches 65 million years ago there was dinosaurs. How, how did we do that? John? This starts to dovetail with next week's lesson. But, oh, okay. Uh, Yeah. And um, so I mean, you could talk about some of that. Obviously, we're not you know, experts in the field, but you can say that there are, you know, for instance, the, the Mount St. Helens eruption, there were uh, th things that rocks that got dated after that lava flow that they estimated at 345,000 years. Wow. And <laughs> you know, it just gives you an example of how faulty the time, the dating methods are. So, I mean, that's that's one thing. But the evolutionists have to put the millions of years in there because then it it introduces death before uh, the fall of man. Yes. So that's yeah. the theological point that needs to be made. Okay, good. Uh, so John is saying basically two things. Okay, first of all, that the dating system is not accurate, and. <clears throat> He gave the example of Mount St. Helens, some of the rocks that were formed from there. They did the carbon dating on it, and they said they were 385,000 years old. Well, actually, they were a year old or whatever. So, and there's a lot of other examples of that where the carbon dating is just, just really off. But the theological point is, is more important than anything else, and that is if dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago, and they died, what happened? Death happened before sin happened in the garden. Is that true? No. Theologically, that's terrible. It was always sin that brought forth death. There was no death before sin. And so if we believe dinosaurs lived and died 65 million years ago, we have thrown out a key portion of what we believe so important. So, good, John, thank you. Any, any other questions or comments on this? Okay. How can dinosaurs be used as an opportunity to share the gospel? Hmm. Good question. We don't try to convince them to believe what we believe, like Pastor said, but is there an opportunity to use dinosaurs to share the gospel? What do you think? I'm sorry? Yeah, they're part of day six. The Bible says God created all these creatures. God created the dinosaurs. Why did he create dinosaurs? They served some purpose. I'm not sure what it was, but they served a purpose. And guess what? God created mankind. But he created mankind in his image. Not in the image of, a, a, of an animal. You know, if we came from apes, that's all we are is a, a, a full-grown ape. We're not an animal. We're, we were made special. God made us special. And if God made the dinosaurs for a purpose, do you think he made us for a purpose? Yeah, I think so. And what is that purpose? To worship and glorify him in, in our lives. That's, I mean, it's... Kind of a little bit of a stretch, but it just goes right into the gospel, doesn't it? We have a purpose. God has given us a purpose just like he's given each animal a purpose. It's so interesting. I haven't done this, but it's so interesting to look at some of creation and some of the animals and how God has given them a certain gift to do what they need to do. 
that can't evolve. You know, how does a spider spin a web? That's an amazing thing. How did that happen? God created him with that ability because that was going to, was how a spider could fulfill his purpose. Amazing. Any, any others? Jim, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, if you present that information that the Bible has, it could convince somebody to, to open their minds to other things. Good. Okay. How do we balance the scientific study of the fossils of dinosaurs and other extinct, extinct creatures with what the Bible tells us about such creatures? How do we balance the scientific study of fossils of dinosaurs and other extinct creatures extinct creatures with what the Bible tells us about such creatures. It's the scientific evidence and there's what the Bible says. How do we balance those things? Any ideas? John? Yeah. Rock deposits, all those things, but the explanation and the reasoning behind them, you know, makes all the difference to the world. Yeah, it does. And again, like you're saying, John, the evidence is there for both sides, but we need to put put in that biblical worldview and share that with people. That's what's so important, Pastor. Right. They created all these things in the world that are dying. It was literally just came about. Mm -hmm. It was time to happen. Uh, it happened where non life became life. And so we're, those assumptions on their part don't take away from the truth of dinosaurs existed or, or whatever creature or whatever they're studying in science or that things function in a certain way. So, like, bones of creatures fit together the way that they do. It's just how they are. There's, that's, not a, that's not a difference. Or, um, so like just the, the major differences that we're seeing Good. age and, and origin. So that's, that's the primary assumptions of these different worldviews as they evaluate. Yeah, Pastor is saying there's, there's two differences we have with, with science, basically. First of all, the dating. Uh, we don't agree with the dating. It's not millions of years. It's thousands of years. And it gets back to, did God create everything he did in six days? Six 24-hour days. The answer is yes. And it's sad to me that so many believers today are trying to say, well, it could have been a thousand years each one. Could God do what he did in six days? Yeah. Do we have a God that can do that? Yes, we do. 
you know, don't, don't shortchange him and say he couldn't do it in, in, in 24 hour day. He had to take a thousand years for each one. You're demeaning God. Uh, you're, you're taking his power and, and negating his power. You know, we have a God that can do that, and he did do that. And it's so sad when we see Christians trying to blend in the philosophy of the world with the biblical worldview. Really a shame. The other thing that uh, Pastor said was a problem, uh, a difference between us and the world, is origins. Where did it all come from? And we believe that God created it. Does that make sense? Does it, I was, I'm sorry. I, I have trouble sometimes with this kind of stuff. Does it make sense that there's a divine creator there that said, I'm going to create animals and I'm going to create people? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Does it make sense that things evolved from this speck? Oh, yeah. Tell me something. How long did it take for a heart to evolve when it worked properly? Only got one shot. <laughs> and then that... It has to have a brain that makes it work. It has to have lungs. Of... How can it? Folks, that takes a lot more faith to believe that than it does to believe that there's an almighty God that created this whole world. I mean, evolution is just fantasy. But the world holds to it. Jim, you had a comment? You know, some unbelievers will say, well, you know, the Bible isn't a science book. No. Yes. But back to your question about how do, how do we balance the scientific study of the problem with the Bible? Sure. The, the purpose of the Bible is not to teach us all about dinosaurs or to teach us all about chemical reactions or anything like that. Of course not. But when something is important to, 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 to show something, like in Job, you know, God's talking to him about these amazingly terrifying creatures and well okay it makes sense for us to talk about dinosaurs mm -hmm. but it's not the purpose isn't well you know what there were these other kinds of dinosaurs and there was other, I mean that's not his point yes uh, anyway. uh, it's a great comment you know the purpose of the Bible is not to prove dinosaurs the purpose of the Bible is not to prove science the purpose of the Bible is to present Jesus Christ and, you know, from cover to cover, it's all about Jesus. Uh, so great, great point, Jim. Thank you. Anything else? One more question. Christians know that they will face ridicule from those who reject the Bible as the authority when trying to understand issues like dinosaurs. How do we deal with such criticisms? Mm -hmm. We'll face ridicule from those who reject the Bible. I think it's not so much about dinosaurs as those that deny the Bible and reject the Bible. What do you, what do, you do with people like that? Any ideas, John? Focus on the gospel. Focus on the gospel. Neither one of us on the sides of the argument have, we're there. So we can't, we, we have to accept what the Bible says by faith. They have to accept evolution by faith. And, but the one thing we can Good point. Present the gospel. It explains it all, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't help if I yell you know, louder than the other guy, John. You know, Mark. Yeah. Before me. 
Thank you. That's an excellent point. You know, with this, we, we, it's, it's the problem sometimes when we pick verses out, and we did it this morning for a certain reason to talk about dinosaurs, but we got to look at all the scripture, and we got to look at the whole portion in Job, and the point was, what was God trying to do? Humble Job. And at, at, the, at the end of the book, uh, wasn't it Job that says these things were too wonderful to understand? Um, it, Job just realized he can't comprehend the greatness of God, and neither can we. His divine transcendence is above everything that we could ever think about. Um, I got four and a half minutes left. That's how long my last video was that won't play, I'm sure. Let me just see. <laughs> Good. What happened? Oh, sorry, I thought I hit a button. I'm not touching any buttons. Pastor, go ahead. Um, so with that previous question that was up there, um, how do we deal with people who ridicule us for pointing to the Bible to like being afraid of dinosaurs? Uh, as I was saying earlier, our job as Christians is not to give a dissertation on dinosaurs from the Bible, as the Bible is not seeking to provide that information. It's not, the, that's not the scripture's purpose. Yes. The goal for us to have a um, logical, rational, biblical worldview is that we need to be able to account for dinosaurs from the scriptures, which it does, but we also want to make sure that like what we're, what we're trying to do is we're as Christians, we are dependent upon the Word of God, and so we, we cannot avoid difficult questions from the world, mm -hmm. that the world is going to hear a Christian's answers based on Scripture and find it unsatisfying. That shouldn't surprise us. Um, it shouldn't be, that should also not ultimately be super discouraging to us, because no. the Bible tells us we're going to either find clear shouldn't be a, a total discouragement to us, because here's the reality, with almost any apologetic issue, even if you have the perfect answer for dinosaurs, for the mm -hmm. earth, there's always another question that they have that's not satisfied by the scripture. Yes. And so these questions, though it is wonderful for us to have satisfying answers, certainly we should want to have satisfying answers for ourselves, because we want to be able to just be confident in what we believe. And that's why even um, over the years that I've been here, I've even sought to explain where our Bible comes from. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to know that? I mean, we're just basing our eternity on words in a book. Yeah. We should know where that book comes from. And so with that type of information, that it will be relevant to science, it will support scientific findings, and that should be used by God build our faith and build our confidence in God and the truthfulness of his word, but ultimately we're not going to convert the sinner by giving their best answer in support of dinosaurs from the scripture. Um, that's, that's a, as you said, that's a tertiary issue. That's not an issue of salvation. Mm, no. But we should be able to account for that. All of that said, as Brother John has been saying, when we're talking to an unbeliever, what's our ultimate goal? Our goal is to the gospel. be an Amen. And that in light of that, God is going to grace us in light of the faithfulness of mm -hmm. the Savior, Jesus. And as we seek to be faithful to the answers in the, in the gospel, God in his grace will show the grace of his will. And, and we will allow others to, to remain in their sin. And it's not our duty to be the Savior. It's our job to be the ambassador that Amen. God can be a faithful witness. Yes. Salvation to the lost. Yeah. So we just want to be faithful to, to God and be faithful to God 
Sorry, I can't sum that up. <laughs> sum it up this way. We need to have biblical answers, but we need to be so careful that we don't dwell on incidental things and forget the gospel, which is our, our purpose. And you know, folks, it's like, it's, it ties into dinosaurs, doesn't it? But you know, it ties into everything. It's so easy with, my, with the bagel boys when we're, we're sitting there eating, drinking our coffee and, and somebody talks about politics. It's so easy, I wanna jump in there and it's like, you know what? It's not, it's not my purpose. Purpose of scripture is Jesus Christ. My purpose should be Jesus Christ. And if I fall into politics, if I fall into dinosaurs, if I fall into anything else that gets me off subject, I'm in trouble. Uh, four minute video, of course, is gone. Uh, sum it up, it was what happened to the dinosaurs. Anybody know? They survived the flood, some of them. What happened to them, Jim? Okay, and there's a lot of different guesses. Bottom line, they're extinct. Whichever ones survived on the ark are now extinct. They said, really? Yeah, do you know how many species are extinct right now? There's a lot of them. Simple explanation. I went over time after having 18 minutes of videos that I couldn't use. Sorry about that. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this topic. Uh, it's not on the top of our theological list, but it's important that we understand that the Bible has answers for everything. And we don't let us ever forget our purpose in life is to glorify you and the Lord Jesus. And may that be our purpose in any discussions we have, whether it be dinosaurs or politics or anything else. Keep us focused. And Father, we just thank you for this time. We pray for Pastor Tim as he brings the message this morning. Use him by your spirit. We pray for each one that may be here this morning that doesn't know Christ as Savior. Maybe this will be the time that they come. We need your Holy Spirit to do that and to work in those lives. We pray to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.